This meeting is being recorded. Welcome to Database Security Challenges and Best Practices Executive Briefing. I'm Angela Obogu from North Door, your host. Before we begin, I'd just like to let you know that we are recording this session. So why are we here today? In our view, database security is being pushed to a lower priority because of customers' fears of making changes to databases, and in some cases, the misconception that databases are already secure. Shortly, we'll be discussing just that, database security challenges and best practices. So with me today is Tom Martin from the Wine Library, Noam Markville and Odin Raz from Infognito, and Pete Finnegan from PeteFinnegan.com Limited. So firstly, let's hear from Tom Martin from the Wine Library. Tom has been in the wine trade for over 20 years. He started his career working for a large off-license operator in the UK, and then moved to Australia and New Zealand to work in the vineyards. Upon his return in 2010, he became the wine buyer for Waithlaids, Laith, Laithwaites, that's right, Tom, isn't it? Yes, that's and, correct. Yeah, and the Sunday Times Wine Club, and is currently the wine buyer for the Wine Library Limited. So, Tom, would you like to give us the rundown on the fabulous wines and cheeses that have arrived on our doorstep a few days ago? Thanks, Angela, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'll quickly run through the wines and the cheeses that uh, I've sent you. Um, so we'll be kicking off with a lovely example of one of the UK's favourite sparkling wines, and that's Prosecco. Um, so this lovely example comes from the Bortolotti family, a very significant name in the history of Prosecco, and it's produced in the higher quality Val de Biedene area, the historic home of this wine style. This Prosecco is produced using 100% of the Glera grape, and this is the most important grape variety in the production of this classic sparkling wine. On the nose, you'll find crisp green and red dessert apples with a little hint of conference pear and white peach. Also has a wonderful floral character of uh, hedgerow blossom and some little suggestions of freshly cut white flowers. On the palate, it's dry, elegant, fresh and lively with apple and citrus flavors and a creamy, subtle finish. Uh, for our first white wine, we're going to have a look at the Isabelle Estate Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc from the 2019 vintage. Isabelle Estate was founded by Mike and Robin Tiller in 1980, and they were for many years the leading supplier to the iconic Cloudy Bay winery. In 1994, they made the switch to bottling their entire estate's production themselves, and have since forged a reputation as one of New Zealand's finest Sauvignon Blanc producers. So this delicious Sauvignon Blanc manages to combine all aspects of the grape variety from hints of passion fruit, gooseberries and grapefruit, right through to the lovely sort of flinty mineral character that is a backbone of all this estate's wine production. Uh, the cheese pairing I've selected is an interesting Irish twist on a classic Dutch cheese. Uh, Killeen's Gout Gouda is made by Dutch-born Marion Rollevold, just outside Port Numa in Galway. The flavours of the cheese are fresh, clean and milky, and they have a wonderful fruitiness and a deep sort of mellow nuttiness that works really well with the Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, our second white wine hails from De Vetsoff Estate in Robertson in South Africa. The De Vets have been farming the Cape since the uh, 17th century and one of the early pioneers of grape growing in Robertson. They were the first to really champion and plant the Chardonnay grape in the 1970s and have built a, a very good reputation as one of South Africa's best producers of the grape variety. The Bon Vallon example is a lovely uh, unwooded Chardonnay that exudes a brisk and clean freshness of green apples, citrus fruit, wild flowers and grilled nuts. And it has a lovely long mineral imbued lingering finish. Uh, the cheese I've selected to pair this lovely wine is uh, the Single Gloucester, and it's produced by master cheesemaker Charles Martel from his herd of old Gloucester cows. 
This is the lesser known sibling to the famous double Gloucester cheese, and it has a softer and more open texture than most English hard cheeses. And it's got a wonderful mild lactic and slightly sweet flavor that pairs perfectly with the unwooded style of the Chardonnay. For our first red wine, we're looking at uh, Finkersfinia's lovely Altusur Malbec. Uh, this is grown in the Tucungata Valley region of Mendoza in Argentina. The vines here are over 1200 meters above sea level and provide ideal conditions for producing rich, fruity, yet well-balanced Malbec. On the nose, the wine has lots of intense ripe fruit flavors with suggestions of cherries, blackberries, blueberries and plums with subtle spicy and floral hints there too. Uh, the palate is fresh and concentrated with sweet round tannins, really good acidity and uh, a really nice length to it as well. Uh, to pair with this wine, I've selected uh, the Italian cheese Telegio. Uh, Telegio takes its name from the mountainous Val di Telegio in northern Italy, where this cheese has been produced since the 10th century. This is probably Italy's most famous example of washed rind cheese, where the cheese is washed regularly with salt water, brine, uh, to create the distinctive orange rind. That gives the cheese a sort of pungent, piquant fruitiness that works really well with the richly fruited Malbec. Um, for our final wine, um, we're looking at the Ladybird Red Blend from Leibach Estate in Stellenbosch in South Africa. Leibach were the first certified organic producers in Stellenbosch. And this, name is, uh, this wine is named in honour of the 3,000 ladybirds released into the vineyard every January to combat the presence of mealybugs uh, without having to resort to spraying. Here you'll find a lovely nose of dark stone fruits with hints of cedar, spice and mocha. On the palate, the wine's full bodied, smooth, uh, with lots of plum and damson fruit and a complex lingering finish. And the final cheese uh, to partner this wine, um, we have the lovely Wookie Hole Cave Age Cheddar. So this cheddar is made at Ford Farm in Dorset. Uh, before it's carried 200 metres down the famous Wookie Hole Caves to age for a further 18 months. This process gives the mature cheddar a really extra sort of earthy, nutty depth of flavour and uh, produces a cheddar of extreme complexity that works beautifully with the fuller bodied styles of uh, red wine. So ladies and gents, I hope you enjoyed the uh, wines and the cheeses this evening and uh, hope you have a very good session. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, I have a newfound respect for, uh, for ladybirds now. Or ladybugs? Oh, he's saying something, but he's on mute. I'm, 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 I'm not sure, to be honest. Or lady beetles. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, very good. Thank, thanks very much, Tom. So okay. please enjoy the, the cheese and wine um, as we discuss the database security challenges and best practices with Pete, Odin and Noam. So let me do some introductions first. Uh, Noam and Odin are VP and MD at Infognito and have been advising organizations on governance, risk and compliance related issues across the UK, Europe and the Middle East for over 20 years. Infognito is a dynamic and creative company dedicated to bringing innovative security solutions to market to discover, classify, and anonymize sensitive data across all organizations' data stores. And then we have Pete, who is the founder and CEO of PeteFinnegan.com Limited. Pete is an Oracle ace for security and Oak Table member. PeteFinnegan.com Limited was founded nearly 20 years ago. Pete specializes in Oracle database security consultancy design and training services, and has developed several related security tools. Pete is also so well known in the industry that his business has been built on referrals. So hi guys. Hi Angela, thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon everyone. Great. Hi. Excellent. Everyone. So we already have uh, several questions from some of the attendees here. So thank you very much for those. Um, so please let me know via the chat box 
or raise your hand if anyone has a question for the panel at any time during the webinar. That's absolutely fine. Um, so given that I've already got some questions from the guys, so thank you. I will pose my first question to Pete. What are the top issues with database security and why should organizations prioritize database security? Uh, a very big and complex question. Well, we can cover the complete gambit of everything about securing data, so I'll try and keep it short. Uh, I mean, the why is obvious, really. I mean, there are data breaches happening constantly, and obviously databases store data, and they will store critical data, maybe financial data, maybe business um, valuable data, maybe health or whatever, something that is valuable to the company. Um, so it would seem obvious that in this day and age, you know, the database stores the data, therefore we should secure the data in the database as well as throughout the rest of the uh, organization application layer and so on. So, you know, even the BBC um, have their own data breach page, even the BBC, when they announce there's been a data breach, uh, they don't even bring experts on anymore because they assume now the public know what a data breach is. You know, if I go back maybe five, six, seven years ago, they used to bring on experts to discuss what a data breach is, what's a computer, what's data, you know, what's personal data and so on. And then we've got things like regulation. So obviously across Europe and here in the UK, GD G can't even say that, GDPR came about fairly recently in the whole spectrum of things, not, not that recently in a number of years. And that's forcing companies to have a potential fine if they lose personal data. Um, if it gets stolen. So there is a regulatory reason, there's a monetary reason to do it. Um, but then if you, you know, flip that around, you know, what are the top issues related to data security? Unfortunately, you know, uh, the biggest issue probably is that it's not taken seriously at all. So I started doing this just over 20 years ago, doing actual database security for Oracle databases. And if I think about databases I looked at 20 years ago and I compare them to some databases I get involved with now, they're very similar. Lots of companies are not taking data security seriously. So they don't have a data, a specific data security policy at the database level. So maybe that's SQL Server, maybe it's Oracle, maybe it's DB2, it doesn't really matter. They don't have specific data security experts often within the DBA team or the security team. You talk to the security guys, they're network security guys, they don't know database security. Databases are complex. You know, there's the risk, as uh, Ange said at the beginning, people don't want to change something because it may break the database. It may break the application. It may cause the, the, you know, the business to slow down. I've dealt with some online clients who've got big websites that um, sell products you know, on a minute, second by second basis, make million pounds a day or more through these websites. These are running on Oracle databases. They definitely don't want them to break because that is money that is not going to come back easily because the business is not being, being done. We have a lack of education. Um, we also have the big problem that canned applications and applications built internally don't consider security. You know, you get, um, if you say something like Oracle, you design your data model, your tables, your screens, everything to do with the application. You focus on functionality, performance, and service level agreements, but you don't focus on security. But guess what? You should focus on security. You know, I've heard people say, well, why don't Oracle make the database secure out of the box or SQL Server secure at the box? It, it won't be because you know, Oracle or Microsoft don't know about your data and we're trying to secure data in a database. So it's impossible. Um, you know, lots of companies treat a database like it's a black box, you know, and they assume that the vendor of the application or the database vendor has made the database secure. Unfortunately, it's not. Um, there's lots and lots of reasons, and primarily is that people are not taking data security seriously. That's the key thing that I've noticed over many, many years. I'll stop there because otherwise I can talk for a long time. Pete, Pete just on yeah. that, um, mm. there's another question here, which I think probably is a good segue into what you've just been discussing. What yeah. do you think is easiest to train a security person to secure an Oracle database mm. or to train an 
Oracle person in security? Um, I would say the easiest is probably to train an Oracle person in security, which is logically the wrong way around, if you think about it. So you get a security professional who should look at securing everything within the organization, but you give them Oracle, they're stuck. The DBA team don't want them to play with Oracle because it's complex. It's very big and complicated. But it's probably easier to have, you know, a security person, if they try and learn Oracle, is a massive task. But if you already know Oracle, learning security is still a big subject, but it's probably easier than learning the intricacies of a database and then being able to demonstrate to the company that you're not going to break it if you suggest changes to it. You know, if you secure an Oracle database, you have to say to the customer, you know, you need to do this or you need to do that or you need to modify this design. If you if they understand you don't know about Oracle, they're, they're not going to believe you and they're not going to do it. So, yeah, I would say train the Oracle person in security. But it comes back to what I said before, it's lack of education. You know, I started doing this more than 20 years ago and literally there are very few people in the world who are regarded as experts in securing Oracle. And that's not changed. And why? Probably because it's complicated. <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> one of the problems. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, I'll let somebody else have a go. Has anybody yeah. has anybody no. else got any comments yeah. on that or uh, wants to say something? You can just raise your hand. There's a button at the bottom of the screen on reactions. You can just click it. Absolutely. Okay. So I am going to come back to you, Pete, in regards to talking around audit audits, uh, audit logging and yeah, yeah. policies and things. I'm going to come back to you with that yeah, in a minute. Yeah. What I might do is um, we've had two years of COVID mm -hmm. and um, I've got a question here for Noam. Um, so let me just pose this to you, Noam. Uh, what changes and trends do we see after dealing with COVID for the last few years regarding data sharing? Well, actually, it's a very, very good question. What we see during COVID, or actually what COVID forced us to do, is to lower our defenses. I mean, in the security area, we are always talking about reducing the attack surface and so on and so forth. What COVID made us do is actually expand the attacking surface. We had to give access to our own workers, developers, testers, QA, you name it, access to our databases remotely. We had to give access to third party business partners, data analysis, data scientists, to our most sensitive and private data over the web. So actually, on one hand, COVID is helping us in the digital, 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 digital in the digital era, and is helping move everything very fast, but it is creating security holes. I mean, before COVID, any remarks, guys? No, before, co on. before COVID, people told us, customers told us, CISOs, DPOs told us that they do not provide remote access for developers. During COVID, they told us, they asked us, how do we provide remote access, secure remote access or secure access to the data for developers because they have to work from home. So COVID have changed things for good, basically. We see the world today, most of the organization are not going back to working on-prem. They work in a hybrid mode. Some of them two days a week, two days, three days in the, in the home office and so on and so forth. But what COVID has showed everyone that remote access and using external service providers business partners is a must for the core business of the organization. The one thing we need to do is to do it in a secure way. The same customer who asked us, how does he provide his developer an option to work from home? Once he saw the quality of our mass copy of the database, then he realized that there basically there isn't a problem for developers from working home on a mask on an anonymized copy of the database. 
So basically it can be done, but COVID, like I said, is making the digital era much faster. It's here, but it has to be done in a secure way with a lot of regards to the details, the small details. We are trying to keep in our crown jewels safe. Our private data is the crown jewel. Thanks, Noah. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, about uh, Incognito and how you discover, classify, and anonymize uh, data. And um, there is a question here in regards to, uh, and this is actually for Odin. What are the most common use cases you encounter for the data anonymization pipeline? So uh, thank you, Angela, for that. And uh, first, a very short brief about Infognito. In Infognito, we allow our customers to connect all their databases and very easily scan for uh, sensitive data. We analyze the data itself and we find where which columns contain sensitive data. And then we can easily create uh, what we call the masking template which allow you to anonymize a copy of your database in order to provide it to uh, other use cases than the production. So what are the most common use cases? So if three years ago, four years ago, the most uh, common use case was creating a, a high quality environment for the developers or for uh, QA and testing purposes, we started to see a transition and uh, customers are uh, transiting into creating high quality environments that contains real business data without real customer data. And those environments are usually pro uh, uh, used by the customer data analysts. So the first scenario, the first common scenario that we are seeing these days in the past two years uh, it's creating a very high quality environments, keeping the, uh, we call it the organizational uh, data intact and anonymizing customers data. This allows the data scientists to work on a high quality data to analyze whatever they want to analyze business-wide without compromising your customer uh, and your employees, of course, uh, uh, PII and personal data. So this is the first scenario. So we see a big transition uh, because you know creating environment for the for the development and QA it's becoming an obvious. We see a lot of effort putting uh, going into creating the high quality data analysis environments. And uh, another scenario which becomes more and more common is creating uh, our customers uh, creating what they called playground or sandbox. And let me explain. Infognito customers are enterprise customers like banks, insurance companies, big customers that have a large amount of databases. And a lot of the time they need to provide some data for outside organizations in order for them to perform some testing. For an example, uh, a lot of our customers don't want to allow access to new companies that want to introduce, want to do POCs. Uh, let's say a company want to do a POC to show how a product works on the organization data. They don't want to install the, uh, the product inside the organization and provide them real access to real data. What they are going, they are building uh, what they are called playground. Playground is a copy of the data that is provided to the third party, which is an external company that needs to do a POC and external companies that need to analyze some of the organization data. And this playground is being anonymized. So the playground contains high quality data of, the, of the, the organization, but the data itself is anonymized. So what these are the main, uh, uh, not all of course, but these are uh, uh, the most common scenarios that we've seen that have been used with Infognito, beside creating development and QA environments when you need to refresh those environments regularly. Oda, what about um, in the situation where we're, we've got a lot of customers now who are migrating to the cloud? 
are you able to um, to help in that scenario? Of course, of course. During migration to the cloud, there are two main phases. First phase is uh, running all the tests and development in order to let's let's say we want to move our CRM from on-prem to the cloud or move some of our uh, databases to the cloud, you want to test this process. So a lot of our customers are using Infognito to analyze the data that is being moved to the cloud, uh, mark sensitive data and mask the data. So you can run uh, the process of building the pipeline to the cloud and running the test, moving data to the cloud on a secure data set. And after everything is done, a lot of our customers also connect Infognito compliance dashboard to the cloud environments in order to know on every certain time where sensitive data is stored in their database. So you can connect, connect our uh, dashboard to your databases and you will see exactly which column contains credit cards, which column contains uh, emails or any other PII or sensitive uh, data in your database near real time. Of course, it depends on the scan ratio. You can scan it every day, every week, but you will get a, a, a very clear view where sensitive data is stored across your organizational databases, including the ones that you just moved to the cloud. Oded, you just mentioned about, about um, uh, the frequency of scanning. Um, what sort of overheads are, are applied with that? Because generally customers are a bit concerned about um, what that overhead might be. This is a very good question. Uh, so our engine, uh, provides uh, what we call near zero footprint, which means we do not scan the entire data. We do not scan the entire database. We are use, we scanning the databases in chunks. So we begin with a very small uh, subset of a random data from the database. We analyze it. And if we think that a certain column or certain table might contain sensitive data, we increase the sample size until we get uh, high quality results. Uh, from our latest benchmark, uh, the entire process takes less than 1% of the CPU of the entire database machine while running, okay? And you can also use throttling in order to control it. And this is why our customers, uh, one of our customers uh, named it and we are using what uh, the, the way he called it, a uh, near zero footprint, because on a regular production environment, you won't, you won't be even notice the classification uh, process. Great, okay, thank, thank you very much for that. That was very good, very informative. C can I go back to Pete now? And um, uh, so I've got a question here, Pete. Why yep. do you think many sites have audit trails and logging for the servers, the networks, and even applications, but do not have so for the database? Um, well, I mean, before I come to why do I think, I mean, I often asked this question when I'm speaking at conferences. I was speaking at the UK Oracle User Group conference a few years ago, and I did a rough count. I was in the big hall, and I did a rough count of the number of people, and there was probably, I don't know, 900 people there, just with my rough counting number of rows, and so on. I asked for a show of hands, said, how many people have got auditing turned on in the database? This is an Oracle conference, so it's obviously Oracle databases. Mm. And Maybe there was 10% or less of the people put their hand up. I said, then keep your hand up if you actually do something with that data. And out of a room of 900 people, there was one person kept his hand up out of the whole room. And there was probably only, I don't know, maybe 50 people actually put their hand up to start with. So those that put their hand up and then brought it down again were collecting audit. They have no idea what it is. They don't know where it's stored. They're not looking at it. This is very, very bad. And I've done this, you know, multiple times, different audience sizes, different countries in the world. And you usually get a, roughly the same sort of reaction to that. So people are not auditing the database. And it goes back to what I said before. They're not taking data security seriously. So not only do they not have a policy, they don't have education. They don't have any hardening of the database. They don't have any controls for users. They don't have least privilege as such. You know, they don't have literally anything at the data security level. But not only that, they don't even know who's in the database and who's doing what to the data. Um, so it, 
you know why i don't know why i i think why is because they treat the database as a black box you know they treat the database as we're not touching that we don't want to break it you know we don't want anything to happen to it i remember many many years ago probably 15 years ago i was involved with a project a big financial um, organization in london and I was asked to come in and help design an audit trail for this uh, database, for this organization. The DBAs were set against it. They didn't want it. So the DBAs, before I came up with my design, turned everything on, absolutely every setting. I then said to management, look, it floods the database, too much data, too much disk space needed. The management weren't so stupid. You know, They basically then said, well, what do you suggest, Pete? I said, well, we should be auditing the things that shouldn't be happening. Mm -hmm. So we, we want to know if somebody's abusing the database. We want to know if somebody's changing users. We want to know if somebody's creating users. We want to know if somebody's granting privileges. We want to know who accesses the database. Really, really important. And most organizations don't do this. Or if they do, it just gets shipped off straight away and no one ever looks at it or understands what's going on. You want to know if somebody changes the security, if there is any security. You know, you want to know if somebody's changing the configuration. That way you've got a reasonable picture fairly quickly that doesn't create a massive overhead, doesn't generate lots of data that has to be written to disk, you know, doesn't cause a performance problem, but people are not doing it. It's it's the same fear thing, I think. You know, I've talked to lots of people and they can't really answer the question. They they always come out with, well, it causes a performance problem or we don't know what to do with it. We don't know what to audit, but that isn't the answer. You know, if you don't know what to audit, you don't then think, well, let's not just do nothing. Let's just not bother. Um, and that's what happens. You know, I see this many, many times. So it's a lack of education again, I guess. Um, I mean, it, it's it's the same picture for everything related to data security, really. You know, there are some people doing it well. They're let, you know, let, let's be fair, some people are doing it well but the bulk of people are not because they're treating the database as a black box and you can't, you know, that data is probably personal data. It's probably, you know, very important to the business to keep the business running. You know, you need to know what's going on with that data. You need to secure that data and protect that data, whether that's masking with these guys or it's actual data security to prevent people from doing something. You know, I mean, has anybody got any comments on that? We're not getting any hand up so far. Has anyone got any input to this from the attendees? It would be nice. <laughs> I'll stop there because otherwise I'll talk all day. <laughs> well, the good thing is, Pete. At least I've uh, we've we've got we've got um, we've got questions from from the guys, which is great. Yeah, yeah. So we yeah. can uh, we can carry on. Uh, but ju just on that, um, mm. it's sort of got me back to thinking about. Um, how do I discover my data? So really, this is back to Odin now. Um, how long and how difficult is it for us to, to be able to discover where our personal data is? So discovering uh, where sensitive data is stored inside the database nowadays is quite easy, okay? Uh, it's only about sampling the right amount of data and comparing it against uh, our built-in rules. So if you only want to scan for, uh, you know, the most common things like names, addresses, emails, those are PII related, most of the PII related things, things are very simple because you got a, a built-in dictionary with high quality rules. The rule, those rules don't usually not don't only rely on patterns, we also rely on dictionaries. For an example, if you want to identify email, it has a very distinct pattern. So you can use a pattern language like regular expression. But if you want to identify a column that contain first names, not last names, not street, you want to identify a column that contain first name, then you cannot rely on a pattern. You need to work with a dictionary. But our product provide you a high quality dictionaries that will allow you to do exactly that in, uh, in let, let's not say in minutes, but in hours, you need to connect your database, you need to choose the PII you want to scan for, you, you need to choose the sample size, and then you need let in for me to do things, come back a few hours later and see the results. But of course, life is not always that simple. Uh, 
if you want to introduce new classification rules, then we need to teach our engine, our classification engine, how to classify new classification rules. Most of our customers add at least 10 or 15 new and customized classification rules that met their organization needs. For an example, if you're a bank, and, uh, you need to introduce your logic to uh, bank accounts because the bank accounts are different from bank to bank, okay? And it's not, by the way, it's also doesn't take a lot of time. Usually customizing our dictionary will take you something between a day or two days. Uh, our uh, engine can learn your data and from data, he can build high quality dictionaries, which then he can use to classify your own custom data. So uh, running classification is easy. You can start seeing results almost immediately then you need to identify what is missing, some custom rule that you need to add. It will take a day or two, and then you can just scan your entire databases uh, one by one or some, you know, 10 by 10, it's up to you, and then you can start getting results. Great, okay. And uh, one of the thing that, that Pete mentioned there was also about masking masking the data um, and, and really I guess this is a question for Noam. Um, why do you think organizations are reluctant to start a data masking project? Well actually I think they are a little bit afraid of it and they are a little bit afraid because it does or could have presented challenges. It's like Pete said database people they are not security people you know we encounter we meet DPOs across Europe and other countries all the time. We meet the compliance people, the cyber security teams, and we ask them, do you know where you have private data in your databases? And they say, of course we do. And then they are going to ask the DBA, where is the private data? And afterwards, they said, yes, of course. The DBA wrote a script of masking who is doing the job. But then every kid could do a script that will reverse the data to the original values. So basically there is a, a, very, a lot of lack of knowledge from the security people and compliance people and privacy people regarding the databases. It is being treated different than any other element in the network, than any word files and so on and so forth. So, and they are afraid of the DBAs. I, I'm very much aligned with Pete here because you see that the DBAs, they are all about efficiency, performance, and so on and so forth. They are not about security, but they are assuring security compliance and, and, and privacy people that they are not violating any regulation. So whenever it comes, you know, even now in 2022, we still see organizations who are scanning manually the databases to find PII, and this is, seriously, it doesn't cut it anymore. The sizes of the databases are getting bigger and bigger all the time. You cannot do it manually. We just performed a, a data discovery scan for a customer in Italy, and we didn't find much, by the way. A lot of PII he wasn't aware of, but we finished a full scan of 70 databases with a day and a half. So customers are not accustomed to it. All systems in this area, all products weren't as efficient as we are. We call our system next generation masking system for a reason. We provide a simple, fast, and a central system that the customers will be able to enforce one identical security policy and privacy regarding PII in the databases. Odette, do you have anything to add on this? You have a, a very large experience in the masking. I think that the customers are afraid mostly of the complexity of the project. Okay, and uh, afraid to, to start a, a process that will never end. And uh, this is the, the this is a uh, what customer are afraid for getting into uh, masking. It looks, uh, from the side, it looks a com uh, like a complex process, but it will take a lot of time. And it, uh, of course it's ongoing, but they think it's ongoing and will never end. 
And uh, oh, that's all done. Sorry, sorry. Leslie, do you have uh, a question? Yeah, well, not so much a question as a um, observation. A lot of people don't master their databases because they don't understand when it's the right time to do it. So you get in the situation whereby I'll mask my test and go, but then I'm in a situation whereby actually I can't establish where my issues are. But then I don't realise that actually if I take a copy of that and mask it, I can then use effective data for training or um, development of product or whatever without influence or without risking that personal data. I think one comment I have, I've been involved with looking for data and the thing that puts people off masking it and why they do cheapish jobs with just scripts and mask small amounts of data instead of all of it is they worried that it breaks the application. So, yeah. you know, they, they know where maybe the customer table is and they might mask the data or obfuscate it or randomize it. Well, then they don't do much else because they're worried that screens that deal with customer data that might be stored somewhere else break because then there's no longer any links between various tables. That's the, you know, I, I've been involved with projects where they basically do it very cheaply and simply because of that, but they shouldn't do that because that is still a copy of the data that stays there in clear text. So they, they're kidding themselves. They're cheating themselves in that, in that sense because they think they've done masking. Well, they haven't done masking. They kept the application yeah. running. Again, it comes back to what I said before. It's just the fear of breaking a database or an application, probably. I agree. And now yeah. today, today products like Infognito allow you to easily mask the entire database and not break in it. Mm. And by the way, thank you for mentioning it. Mm. A lot of the customers still trying to convince me that they should mask the entire database they should mask no no i don't mean that yeah i mean i meant find every copy of specific pieces of data that you want exactly. to mask yeah but exactly. they should exactly. still join up uh, exactly this and this yeah. is what exactly what info we need to do we scan the entire database and then we know exactly where all the accounts are mm. and we just mask them consistently and we don't care uh, about uh foreign keys, primary keys, and applica um, applicative relations, because as long as they are masked consistently across mm. all of the occurrences, you are good. The application yeah, yeah. I mean, for years, Oracle have been pushing TDE as a solution for PCI to protect credit card numbers. So it's a similar problem. Yeah, you but know, it's only addressed. The, yeah, exactly. That's the point <laughs> I say to people. I say this to people. So yes, it's secured at rest on the disk. But as soon as a DBA logs in with SQL Plus, they can do select star from credit card table and see all the data because Oracle transparently decrypts it. You know, it's not a solution. Correct, uh, me I, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, in the memory, it's, still, it's already un, uh, decrypted. Yeah, yeah, it's decrypted. The data is basically stored encrypted on disk, but then it's decrypted. What you need is a combined solution. You need to do TDE, so that it's in, it's encrypted at rest, but you then need to use database vault or TSDP, you know, to mask or um, to encrypt or protect the data at runtime. You need a combined solution that then stops somebody from using a tool to just read the data directly. It's about understanding, again, it comes back to what I said before, you have to understand the complexities of the database, but if you do, you can do it and it works it's 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 not that difficult really if you understand what you're doing it's a, it's about fear people are in fear of changing anything this is the problem but we have to convince them they're not in uh, that they shouldn't be in fear and it won't break it and they can have a secure database with secure personal data in it that is no longer really personal data that they can use for test or dev like uh, leslie just said yeah yeah so so odin um would you recommend would you recommend that people do a subset before performing an actual masking? Is that no, uh, actually no, actually what I was starting to say that we recommend creating a full copy of a database and mask the entire copy. Don't go the subset way because then you will you will start to run into recur recursive relations. 
and right. you find yourself spending a lot of time trying to analyze all the relations and all the, the between the data instead just simply mask the entire database okay it sounds like it will take much longer but the actual practice is that masking large databases even will be much faster than start to analyzing how to create a subset and only mask this subset right okay great does anyone else have any other any questions there um let me I've, I've got one other question here which uh for for pete mm -hmm. why do you think that sites have security policies and adhered to them but seem to ignore these policies <laughs> in the database well, it's the same answer <laughs> so I, again. I know you've, you've sort of been around that earlier yeah but yeah, yeah let's let's nail it on this one go on yeah i mean i've seen this many many times if you go to a site to do a security audit or help somebody secure a database you find that they don't specifically have anything that says what a secure database should look like they'll have an overall security policy for the organization they might have an access and use policy so the policy that says your password must be so many characters and it must last for so many days uh, and so on well, then you find that that's adhered to on the desktop. So, you know, if I come into your organization and I get hold of your smart card or I get your password and, and I log in, you know, I'll get fired immediately in most organizations. But if I then am the DBA, I log in as SIS and every, in Oracle and everybody else does. All of the other DBAs do. We're all sharing yeah. accounts and that's legal and accepted but it's against the overall security policy of the organization and then you see all the developers are logging in with the passwords of the schemas that own all the data so there is no data security so if you put data security around the data but you let everybody log in as the same user there is no security it's completely mute it's pointless and that's primarily about the same problems we've discussed. You know, there is no policy, there is no structure, there's no hierarchy, there's no comeback if you do it. You know, if you, like I say, if you, if I share your desktop login, I'll get fired. But if all of the DBAs log in with the same password, no one's going to get fired. They, in fact, they're going to get cheered if they um, keep the database running when there's a problem. You know, they've all logged in with the same account. But then it comes back to the other question about <laughs> audit trail again. You know, if there's no audit trail, uh, even if there is an audit trail, but everybody logs in with the same account, you've got no idea who did it. You know, it's it's just a it's just a, a lack of you know seriousness of data security that you need to treat the data store, the database, with respect and secure it, and build a policy, educate people around it, change working practice build least privilege, create data access controls, do all of these things to make the data secure and obviously mask it. You know, if you stop, I, people always say to me, what's the number one thing you should do to secure a database? I say, stop people connecting to it. <laughs> Don't let them connect directly. And it's just obvious. It's really simple at the end of the day. Yeah. But then it becomes more complex. You know, what do you mean by that? Well, every employee who needs to connect should still connect. Those who don't need to connect should not carry on connecting and doing things. And then you need to make the password secure, which invariably they're not. You know, I did an audit just a few weeks ago. The main passwords of the database were 14 years old. They hadn't been changed for 14 years, but they were only five characters. You know, and it's just this lack of respect of securing the database. It's a it's, security mechanism, Pete. They sh they, they're making sure they know how to connect. They're making sure no one's going to let just get locked locked out because everybody knows the exactly. password. And then that, exactly. that that database gets copied and you know it gets put in the cloud or it gets uh, sent to a vendor who supplied the application. So they give them all of the production data and they don't even consider that this is completely illegal probably under reg data regulations and so on but they do it i see this all the time these types of issues that it's this lack of connect between data people and security people and we need to close that gap that you know the data people treat security properly and the security people understand enough about the database to understand what to do to make the data secure within the database you know that's a key thing 
but we've got a long way to go and it's not changed massively in 20 years it's still very very similar people are just not doing it i don't know why uh, other than fear of breaking things i'll stop there that was a very passionate finish on that one <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> No, that was great. That, that okay. was really good. Thank you very much for that. Um, That's all right. Right. So does anyone have any further questions at all for any of the panel or even or even for Tom? Tom's still with us as well, um, our wine expert. Um, so if anyone has, has any questions for him as, as well, that'd be lovely. Um, I mean, I, I must admit, I do have one really quick one, Tom. I'd really like a recommendation for a um, dessert wine, not too sweet, <laughs> um, for, for my Sunday lunch. <laughs> if, if I can have a quick recommendation, that would be great. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just jot that down. Well, to, to look for things that are described as late harvest rather than a lot of uh, dessert wines are um, produced uh, using grapes that have actually sort of noble, what we call noble rot. They've been affected by a fungus called Botrytis sniera, which causes the grape variety or the grapes on the vine to actually sort of raisin. Um, if you find something that's described, described as late picked, they're just picking the grapes a little bit later on and they don't have quite the same sort of intensity. So good uh, examples of this often come from the Jurisson region in southwestern France, where they don't, it's very windy, very dry. This particular fungus doesn't, uh, doesn't occur. So they just late, late, late pick it, or sometimes they cut the canes um, as, as well. So that's my recommendation for something. If you want a sweet wine, but without it being too sticky and cloying. Oh, great. Thanks, Tom. That's really helpful. Right. Okay. Um, well, I hope everyone has enjoyed database security challenges and best practices executive briefing. Let me just share my uh, my screen here. And. There we go. Right, so thank you very much to our presenters, uh, to Tom, Noam, Odin and Pete, and thank you all very much for joining. Uh, I'll follow up with some further information from the guys and um, we are all of, uh, and with our contact details as well. So without further ado, um, we will say goodbye. So goodbye from me and um, Thank you all very much for joining and have a lovely evening. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. Thanks. Thank you everyone. Thank Bye you. everybody.